Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I'm glad to have you with me tonight. I'm going to be talking about a really difficult and controversial subject. I'm going to adjust my camera here. I have already prayed, so I'm going to get into the lesson. I'm not going to waste time here because I've got a really important lesson. Back about, oh, maybe 15 years ago, I read a book by the recently deceased R.C. Sproul, and the book was basically about the phrase, this generation, as we know it in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus, well, actually in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, where Jesus says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, and he had just given a bunch of information out about what was going to happen with the temple and, you know, what was going to happen all the way to the sign of his coming. And so R.C. Sproul in that book made the statement something to the effect that uh, that particular verse was probably responsible for more people rejecting the gospel than any other verse in Scripture. So I realize that I am dealing with a very delicate subject. And I want to be careful how I handle it. And I have, I promise you, I have approached this with a lot of prayer because I don't want to push anybody away. I want this to draw people in because I want people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I get started with the lesson, I just want to say, please share the message. Please share if you're on Facebook, if you're watching on Facebook and there is one person watching, please share. And um, also uh, be sure and Subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is RK Brown, and uh, be sure and, you know, hit the bell so you can get notifications. Now, anyway, back to the lesson. I decided to show every verse in the Bible that has the phrase, this generation, so we can get a, <clears throat> a really good understanding of what that phrase generally means, and then I'm going to take off somewhere where you probably don't expect me to go. But I think I'm going to prove my point very well tonight with scripture. So let's go get on into the lesson. The phrase, this generation. Genesis 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Psalms 12, 7. This is a real famous verse. A lot of King James only people use this verse, including myself. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. And, of course, he was talking about his words, that his words were pure. Anyway, we won't go there right now. Psalms 71, 18. Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. Psalms ninety five ten. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. So I think so far we can say that he is definitely talking about a contemporary generation. Whoever is doing the talking there, they're talking about contemporary generations so far. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the market and calling unto their fellows. Now, once I get into the New Testament, we're going to see repeats of, of these verses because they happen in all three Gospels, okay? So again, Matthew 11, verse 16. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. Matthew twelve forty one, The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Now you will uh, see that that says Jonas. In the New Testament, it says Jonas because it was translated from Greek. but And that's that would be the Greek pronunciation of Jonah. But that's who he's talking about, Jonah. And we'll see that again when we see Zechariah, son of Berechiah, because it will say Zacharias, son of Berechiah, but it's the same person. All right? Matthew twelve forty two, The queen of the south 
shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, I think in those last verses that we just read, I think it's very clear again that Jesus is talking about his contemporary generation when he says this generation because he says a greater than Solomon is here. I'm just saying. I could be wrong. I don't think so. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Matthew twenty four thirty four, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And of course that's our working verse for the whole for the whole lesson. Mark eight twelve and he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why does this generation seek after a sign? And verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. Wow. He used that phrase twice in that verse. And the interesting thing is that the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians one twenty two, The Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So when Jesus says, uh, where was the verse? Uh, and he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. Now in this particular case, I don't believe that the Apostle Paul, when he says the Jews seek after a sign, is saying that this generation and only this generation of Jews is seeking after a sign. That's just their nature, just as the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews are, because they were a people who were brought up on the words of God, even though they perverted them, they still sought after a son because they understood what the things that the prophets did, like the prophet Elijah and Elisha and Moses and all that. So they sought after a sign from Jesus, and Jesus said the only sign that's going to be given is the sign of the resurrection, the sign of Jonah. All right? Mark 13.30. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Luke 7.31 And the Lord said, Whereunto then shall I liken the men of this generation? And to what are they like? They are like unto children sitting in the marketplace and calling one to another and saying, We have piped unto you and ye have not danced. We have mourned to you and ye have not wept. Luke 11.30 for as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also be the son of man to this generation. Remember again, I said that the Apostle Paul said, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So again, he said that Jesus would be the sign to that generation, and yet they wouldn't receive him. But Jesus was the sign, the sign of the resurrection. For Jesus said, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall also the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That was the sign that he gave to them, and the only sign. He said, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given but the sign of Jonah. Okay? So when he says this generation seeks after a sign, I think it's a little deeper than just his contemporary. The Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemned them for she came from the uttermost or the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold a greater than Solomon is here Luke 11:32 the men of Nineveh shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonas and behold a greater then Jonas is here. Again, obviously he's talking about a contemporary generation. Uh, let's see, where was I? Okay, right here. That the blood of all the prophets which are shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Now I'm going to get into that verse a little deeper here in just a couple of minutes. And then we're going to start getting deep. From the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, 
which perish between the altar and the temple, verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Luke seventeen twenty five. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. Of course, Jesus was talking about himself. Well, <clears throat> don't want to give away the story yet. Don't want to get too ahead of myself. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all be fulfilled. Okay, so I've given you every Bible example where the Bible uses the term this generation. And for the most part, it is talking about whatever contemporary generation the writer is speaking of. But we see in a couple of instances where it's not necessarily talking about the generation contemporary, but the generation, the people, that people generated, if you know what I'm saying. And I'm going to show you deeper into that about the word generation and the word regeneration. Okay, but now check out, I'm going to go a little deeper into those verses about Zechariah. So check this out. I hope I'm not moving too fast. <laughs> I almost, sometimes I almost can't keep up with myself because I just get to kind of rolling so fast that I'm, you know, just, uh, I get inside my head, I guess. And maybe I think that everybody's inside my head. This will be a good time to stop and take a sip of water. And then <clears throat> maybe a sip of coffee. Now, there's a few people on. This would be a good time to tell you that if uh, the Lord puts it on your heart, please share. And also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is RK Brown, and hit the bell so that you can get notifications. And now, back to the lesson. Enough of this intermission. Jesus says in Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous. A sepulchre is a tomb. It's a grave. It's, I guess, the outer part of the grave or whatever, you know. It's a tomb. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, Ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. For oh, fill ye up then the measure of your fathers. So he's saying y'all, y'all say that you know you wouldn't have killed the prophets like your fathers did, but because of the very fact that you say that your fathers killed the prophets, you're acknowledging that they're your sons. So do what your fathers did, and that's exactly what they did when they crucified Jesus, when they killed the Holy One and the Just. Verse 32, verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Now, was he talking about just that contemporary generation there when he said ye generation of vipers? Or was it something a little deeper? Let's keep going. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes and some of them Ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. That upon you, remember this generation, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar." Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Now, check out what he said. That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, the son of Berechias, whom ye, whom y'all, if Jesus were in South Georgia or South Tennessee or South anywhere below the Mason-Dixon line, he would have said, whom y'all slew between the temple and the altar. Whom ye, it's anytime it's a Y word in the King James Bible, like you, ye, yours, it's plural. It means he's talking to a group of people. If it's a T word like thee, thou, thine, that means he's talking to an individual. So he's telling them, that group of people, whoever he's talking to, that ye slew Zacharias, son of Berechias, on the altar. And he said that to woe unto you Pharisees, hypocrites. He said that to the Pharisees. Now, 
I was having a conversation with my mom about this yesterday because a lot of times I, she gets the heads up on, on uh, what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, she even said something that I read. My mom is really on top of it. Pretty good. You know, she says she can't remember scripture like she used to be able to when she was young. And, you know, I appreciate that. She's 78 years old. But she knows the Bible. And she knows what people say about the Bible. And she said, well, you know, some people say that that's, uh, that's a different Zechariah, that that was the Zechariah who was John the Baptist's father. However, this verse here called him Zechariah, the son of Berechias. Now, check this out. In Zechariah 1, verse 1, it says this, In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord unto Zechariah, the son of Berechiah the son of Iddo, the prophet, saying. So we see clearly that that is the Zechariah that Jesus is talking about, the son of Berechiah. Now, the thing is, that happened like more than 500 years, or about maybe probably more than 500 years before Jesus. Jesus said, y'all killed Zechariah between the temple and the altar, and that happened... 500 years before Jesus said that. And he said, y'all. So now when he says all the blood of, of the, you know, all the blood that's been shed on the earth, all the righteous blood since Abel all the way to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, will be laid on y'all, this generation, because y'all slew him. Y'all are the ones that did it. So obviously he's not talking about a contemporary generation. He's talking about a people, a seed. And the word generation, the root word is genos. I believe the root, the Greek word is genos, and it means gene, or it's, you know, it's where we get the word gene from. Genos, or genomai, it's where we get the word gene. So this gene, it's going to come on this gene, this generation of people. I hope I'm making that clear. Now, I'm going to kind of come back to that. I'm going to kind of come back to generation in a minute. But before I do, I'm going to go into some things because you remember the working verse, and I probably laid this out all, all kind of whompy job. Probably didn't lay this lesson out right as I kind of get all over the place sometime with these things. But um, I'm going to go into some things now that surely have not come to pass. And one of the reasons why people reject the gospel is because they see that these things that I'm talking about haven't come to pass. And that they certainly did not come to pass in that generation that Jesus was speaking to. And when they see Jesus talking and saying this generation, it looks like he's talking to his generation, but all those things didn't come to pass. And so they say, well, Jesus didn't tell the truth, so the whole thing is a, whole thing is a facade. The whole thing is just not true. However, we're going to see these things certainly did not come to pass, but he wasn't talking to a contemporary generation. I'm also going to say, though, that he wasn't talking to just a future generation, that he was talking to a people, a generated people, if that makes sense, because we are regenerated people. And I'm going to show you that we're also a chosen generation. But first of all, let's go into things that have not yet come to pass. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That certainly has not happened. Jesus wasn't talking about the Jews there. A lot of people say he's talking about the Jews, but he wasn't talking about the Jews there. That was in Matthew 24. That's the Olivet Discourse. The other thing in Matthew 23, he was talking to the Pharisees. But in Matthew 24, he's talking to his disciples, and he's saying, You shall be hated of all nations. How did he say it again? They shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. That has not happened in all nations yet, but it's coming. Even in Revelation chapter 11, when it talks about the two witnesses that they preach in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, even where our Lord was crucified, that they were killed and their dead bodies lay in the streets for three and a half days and they weren't allowed to be put in graves. And the people of the earth actually sent one another gifts because these two witnesses tormented them and they were glad to see them dead. And they're going to be glad to see us dead. There's going to come a time 
when the people of the world are going to be glad to see when the beast begins to make war against the saints. They're going to love it. So that has not come to pass yet. And the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. So we see that that clearly has just now begun to happen, that that couldn't happen in ages past. Now, if I were a preterist, I might try to use these verses to say that it did happen. Check this out. 1 Corinthians one twenty three. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. It says here, uh, where did he say it? Uh, moved away from the hope of the gospel and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So Paul said that at his time the gospel was preached unto every creature under heaven. So was the gospel preached in all nations then? I don't think so, all the, because I really don't think that it was preached overseas. Uh, you know, I don't know if the Native Americans were on the land yet, but it certainly wasn't preached to them. And I certainly don't believe in Mormonism that, you know, Jesus, before his ascension, went and preached to the uh, Lamanites or whatever they were called over here in the, you know, in the, uh, the Americas. I don't believe that. That's a false doctrine. The Bible don't say that. We depend on the Bible, and the Bible does not say that in any way. Check this out. On the day of Pentecost, we see this happening. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. So I can imagine some preterist trying to say, well, right then, at the day of Pentecost, the gospel was preached to every nation under heaven because to the Jew, a part is the whole. So if the gospel was preached to one man out of every nation, that meant it was preached to the whole nation. And of course, that man would then take the gospel back to his nation and preach it, you know, because they were all gathered for the day of Pentecost because it was a, requ a requirement in the law that they had to go each year, that all the men had to go each year to one of three of the feasts that God prescribed that they go to. So a lot of men from every nation under heaven at that time were at the day of Pentecost. So some preterists might try to argue that that came to pass, but not to all nations. Not to all nations. That only has now begun to happen. If all that stuff happened in 70 AD and, and before, then what's the point of us even preaching the gospel? We'd be wasting our time because it's already all done, right? Moving on. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chamber, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Have we seen that happen? Has everybody in the world seen Jesus coming? Because Jesus said, if they say he's in the secret place, don't go, because everybody's going to see the coming of the Son of Man. Did that happen in 70 AD? No, no. Now, the preterists will try to allegorize everything. They'll say, well, Jesus came in judgment. He came in 70 AD in judgment. But no, that didn't happen like that. And I will show you momentarily that that could not be the case. All right? Moving on. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Hadn't happened yet. And the moon shall not give her light. Hasn't happened yet. The stars shall fall from heaven. Hasn't happened yet. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Hasn't happened yet. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Hasn't happened yet. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the son of man coming in the clouds of heaven with great power and glory have we seen that happen yet all the tribes of the earth have they seen that no and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from the one end of heaven to the other 
Have we seen that happen yet? Has he sent his angels to gather his elect from the four winds of the earth to the four winds of heaven with the sound of a trumpet? Has that happened yet? And obviously the sound of a trumpet, if you see in Revelation, the sound of a trumpet is a voice, and it's a voice carrying a message. So again, the preterists might try to say, well, yeah, he sent his angels or his messengers to gather his elect, his preachers to gather his elect <clears throat> from all over the earth, except for look what the Apostle Paul says about the trumpet that goes with this event. In 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty one, we see, the Apostle Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. The resurrection has not happened yet. The Apostle Paul jumped all over these two guys named Hymenaeus and Philetus because they said the resurrection had passed, and it has not passed yet. 1 Thessalonians 4.15 For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them or go before them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Have we seen that? No. Nope. With the voice of the archangel. Remember he's going to send his angels to gather his elect. And with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Did that happen? Were the people who were alive and remained after 70 A.D., were they caught up together with the Lord in the clouds to forever be with the Lord? That did not happen. Because he said, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye that, that those of us which are alive and remain would be caught up together with them in the clouds. That has not happened. All right? And then, check this out. Another thing that Jesus sort of made a hint of was, well, let me see if I have dealt with everything here. And he shall appear the sign of the Son of Man. Um, oh, oh, no, I, I left some, I didn't finish some verses here. I'm sorry. <clears throat> now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. You know that summer is nigh. Okay. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Now, I made a, um, a teaching a good while back, some six or eight months ago, called the fig tree. And in the teaching of the fig tree, I showed with Old Testament Scripture and New Testament Scripture where Judah, particularly southern Israel, if you will, the Jews, were the fig tree and the vine of the earth. And that Jesus cursed the fig tree and said that no fruit would grow on it anymore forever because he found a fig tree that only had leaves on it. And so Jesus said here that when you see the fig tree sprouting leaves, when his branches tender and puts forth leaves, no fruit, mind you, because Jesus said the fig tree would bear no more fruit. But when you see the fig tree put forth leaves, you know that the end is near. We know that Israel is back over in the land of Palestine. We know that the people that call themselves Jews are over in the land of Palestine. And they were not there for, you know, a couple of thousand years. They went back over there and became what they call Israel in 1948. So when you see the fig tree put forth leaves, not fruit again, mind you, then you know the end is near even at the doors. And he said, Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Boy, I'm really talking my throat dry tonight. However, I still don't think that he's talking about a contemporary generation here or there. I think it's deeper than that. I'm going to go into it, like I said, in just a few minutes. But remember, the fig tree... It's not going to bear any fruit, but the fig tree is there putting forth leaves to signify that we are at the end. 
and that this generation shall not pass. Remember, Jesus was talking to his brethren. That generation, or this generation, us. I'm going to show you what I mean in a few minutes. But before I do, I want to say one more thing. That Jesus talked about, he dropped the hint that he might delay his coming. I know I'm moving fast. I'm moving through a lot of scripture. You can go back and watch this again. And uh, maybe some of you can take notes. And uh, welcome everybody that's watching. And uh, I'd like to uh, also tell you that uh, when you get done here, be sure and uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel and hit the bell for notifications. And um, <laughs> you hear my keys going. Pow. So anyway, um, Jesus dropped the hint that he might delay his coming. Check this out. Who then, this is also in Matthew 24 in the Olivet Discourse. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But, and if, that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So I'm not saying that Jesus said that he would definitely delay his coming. But he dropped the hint that he might delay his coming. And obviously, he did, because now we're 2,000 years later. So he obviously delayed his coming. But he didn't just come right out and say he was going to. He just dropped the hint. Now, some of you dispensationalists that might be watching this are going to say, well, all this stuff, RK, all this stuff was talking to the Jews. And he's talking to the Jews in the end times, too, because the church is going to be raptured away, pre-tribulation rapture, and all this is going to be to the Jews. So Mark says, Jesus said in, in the Gospel of Mark, in the Olivet Discourse, this, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take ye heed. Watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. And, of course, those were watches in the temple, like, uh, you know, there were certain blocks of time there were like four blocks of time in the temple where they had three hour watches and uh let's see no i guess it would be six hour watches because it was 24 hours so they were blocks of time and so they um that's what jesus is talking about those blocks of time the the watch times at the temple watch ye therefore for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning i guess it was a 12 hour block i'm sorry Lest coming, suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. Watch. He's saying that unto all. He's not just saying that to the Jews who were left behind. He's saying that to all his disciples. Watch. For you know not when the master cometh. He may delay his coming, as he said over there in Matthew. So just keep watching. And that's what we're doing. We're watching. I'm a watchman. I'm trying to help you to see the signs of the times and to understand the signs of the times. Now, if you will, if you will notice, I have set forth the idea that when Jesus is talking about this generation, he is not talking about a contemporary generation of either his time or of our time. He's talking about a people, a people generated, in this case, generated by the Holy Ghost. A people, a generation of people. Check out what the Apostle Paul Peter, or the, the Apostle Peter, <laughs> when I say Apostle, Paul just rolls out right after it because I talk about him so much. 
the Apostle Paul Peter. The Apostle Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 2. Check this out. I love it. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should sow forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Now, we know that that language applies to the Gentiles. So when the, you know, if you watch my lesson last week and I talked about those people who say that, you know, the Hebrew roots people or some hyper dispensationalists say that, you know, really the Gentiles ought to be reading the epistles of Paul. Well, Peter is obviously talking to Gentiles there because he said, you who were not a people are now the people of God. And he called us, and we know that there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, that we are all one in Christ Jesus. There's one body, one church, one bride. So we know that it is made up of Jew and Gentile, and he calls us a chosen generation. So when Jesus says, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, I don't personally believe that he's talking about a contemporary generation of his time or a contemporary generation of our time. I think he's talking about a people. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I believe that's what he is talking about. And I'm going to prove it even more right here. This is Jesus talking. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then uh, the apostle Paul says in Titus three five, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he hath saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. So either regeneration means that God is going to wind us all back to the beginning of our lives and start all over and, and we're going to live our lives again as a regeneration, or he's talking about something else. He's talking about being born again, being regenerated. We are a chosen generation. So when Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled, you know, when he said like, ye shall be hated of all men, of all nations and afflicted and all that kind of stuff. When he said that, he was talking about the generation of believers. And when he called those Pharisees a, uh, how did he say it? A generation of vipers. He wasn't just talking about those, you know, a 40-year span of time. He was talking about those Pharisees, and they're still a generation of vipers. If you read the Babylonian Talmud, you will see clearly that they are a generation of vipers. They hate the Lord Jesus Christ. Still, just as much as they ever did, they would crucify him again. I'm sure a lot of y'all have seen that, that female Jewish comedian who said, uh, uh, I'm glad they crucified Christ. I would blank do it again. I'd do it again, she says. So they hate Jesus Christ. They are still a generation of vipers. And we, those who believe on Jesus Christ of the Jew and the Gentile, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, are a chosen generation. I hope that I have made that point clear. So you can rest assured that what Jesus said is going to come to pass, is surely going to come to pass. This generation will not pass until all these things be fulfilled. All right? That's my lesson. I can't believe I made it through it. Praise God. I made it through this lesson. Let's see if anybody's still on. Yeah, hey, everybody. I appreciate y'all watching. And uh, if you will, please share this. And also uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is RK Brown. And uh, hit the bell, and so you can be notified whenever I put a new message up. Which, of course, I'm going to put one up tonight. Um, also, come and visit us at Fatherland Baptist Church in Madison, Tennessee. Um, 
It is a sweet, sweet group of people with a pastor who's 80 years old. And I'm telling you, that man is full of wisdom. It's not, I, I'm, I'm going to say this, and, and I love my pastor. It's not the strongest meat. It's not strong meat. It's kind of milk. But I love my pastor. He preaches the truth. And it's a congregation of people who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you think that you might want to come and worship with us, we would be glad to have you. If you live in the Madison, Tennessee area, come and worship with us. If you don't live around Madison, Tennessee, or you just don't want to come worship with us, find yourself a church and get into it. The Bible exhorts you to do so with such scripture as this. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. So don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. The reason why is, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So you need to find yourself under the authority of a pastor. So you can't do that unless you're involved in a local church. Stephen Anderson, actually, who I have a lot of respect for, I don't agree with him on everything because I, I see election and predestination differently than he does. However, I actually think he's probably the best Bible teacher on the Internet. That man knows the Bible incredibly. And, uh, well, I went down a rabbit trail, and I think I forgot, <laughs> they forgot what I was going to say about it. Um, oh, yeah, he, he says that uh, he believes that when the Bible uses the word church, that it only means the local church, that he doesn't believe in the idea of a universal church. I actually disagree with that because in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that you have come to the Mount Sion, to the uh, assembly of the firstborn or to the church and assembly of the firstborn, some, to the first church and assembly of the firstborn, something like that. I can't remember. It's uh, Hebrews twelve twenty two. Go and look it up. But anyway, it gives the idea that, that it's a universal church. So I don't believe what he said, that there's not a universal church. However, you need to be involved in a local church so you can be taught how to minister to the brethren first and foremost and then go out and preach the gospel to a lost and sinful and dying world who need to hear the gospel of Christ so that they can be saved. All right. Let me see. I believe I have one more issue to deal with here. Last week in my lesson, I said that I didn't know uh, where it was in the Bible that it said that Luke was a Gentile and that I had heard that all my life, but I really didn't see it in the Bible. So I'm thumbing through Colossians chapter four the other night. Well, I actually was reading all of Colossians in a, well, I think I was reading three and four. Anyway, um, I was reading that and I stumbled on these verses and it looks like that the Apostle Paul is saying that Luke is a Gentile, but I'm not completely convinced, but I'm not completely not convinced. I went, on the, I went out on the Internet to see if anybody else had talked about it, and I found where a brother used these, these same exact scriptures, and he said that he believed that the scripture was saying that Luke was a Gentile. But I'll give you the scriptures and you can make up your own mind about it. I, I don't guess it really matters, except that, you know, he said that Luke wrote... Uh, one of the Gospels, one of the four Gospels, and he wrote the book of Acts. But um, anyway, I'm going to take you out there because I don't, I, you know, if I put out any false information, I want to correct it. So I'm not necessarily saying that I put out false information, but I'm saying that Luke could very well be a Gentile. So check this out. The Apostle Paul in Colossians 4 verse 7 says, All my state, or my well-being, Tychicus, or shall Tychicus declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and, and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your heart with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, a Gentile. And you'll see in a minute how that is. They shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner saluteth you and Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom ye received commandments. If he come to you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called justice, 
who are of the circumcision. So he's talking about Aristarchus and Jesus, who is called Justice, who are of the circumcision. And in other words, they're Jews. These only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Um, Epaphras, who is one of you, a Gentile, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus and the church which is at his house, which is in his house. So he he says that Aristarchus and Jesus, who is called Justice, were of the circumcision, and uh, Onesimus and uh, Tychicus were uh, of the Gentiles, and then Epaphras was of the Gentiles. And then when he talks about Luke and Demas, he really doesn't say one way or another, but it's almost like he lumps them in with the Gentiles. So it is very possible that Luke is a Gentile. So I kind of wanted to put that out there so that... Uh, I can, to some degree, correct what I said last week. I'm not entirely sure that Paul is saying that Luke is a Gentile, but it kind of looks that way. So anyway, that is that. Thank you for joining me for Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. I've really enjoyed doing this message. <laughs> this is quite a message. I've never heard it done like this, but I think I have done it right. I think I have properly understood the word generation and hence understood the term this generation. So again, I say to you, go to my Facebook page or my YouTube page, which is RK Brown and like it and hit the bell and subscribe. And uh, you'll be notified if I put any messages up there like this one is going to go up there as soon as I get done with this. And of course, please hit the like button on this one and um, also leave me any comments if you have any comments. And uh, if you're trolling me, I'll erase your comment. So, you know, that's pretty much that. And, uh, I appreciate you joining me for Rightly Dividing the Word with R.K. Brown. Have a blessed week. Good night.